and uh, hopefully help hope, hopefully me, helping me grow two weeks ago uh, as I was getting ready to start this series uh, which uh, was uh, the shadow of anger was that first week of the topic and and I told you all in that sermon the story of my being irritated or angered by not receiving a gap, gas receipt at the gas station uh, you know which is kind of one of my pet peeves anyway the following week I stopped at the Kroger gas pumps uh, to get some gas for my car, and a young person from this church also stopped in, and they parked on the other side of the same pump that I was pumping from, and uh, this person got out, this young lady got out, smiled at me, and said, boy, I sure hope that thing gives you a receipt, (laughs) and she was real sweet about it, and I think she was having fun, I think, so I laughed, but to myself, I thought, thank you, Jesus, Uh, I need friends like that, uh, that who out of Christian love can speak into my life, uh, reminding me that, that how we live is a witness, right? But evidently, the Lord has not perfected me yet, because after last Sunday service, after lunch and a quick nap, Margie and I, we volunteered to babysit for our daughter Cassie's four grandchildren for about six hours that evening, while she and her husband, they both work for Marion University in the athletic department, and they were hosting a greet and meet between coaches and athletes and so they were going to be gone for till, till about nine o'clock that night but when we arrived home so so we did that we went and 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 uh you, did i mention they're all under the age of five and uh and so you know six hours doesn't seem like much but we were exhausted till we got home you know and we arrived home exhausted we walked into the garage and we could hear the sound of water gushing coming from underneath the house in the crawl space so I, I opened the lid to the crawl space, and I crawled down in there, and there at the pressure tank was this fountain of, of water just spraying like Old Faithful all through the crawl space, you know. And I mean, it's spewing water like crazy. And in a panic, I throw the breaker to the tank. Nothing happens. I shut the spigot off. You know, nothing happens. I, I, I go in the house for some reason and turn, all, turn the switch or the, the, the valve off in there. Nothing happens. Finally, I go... The pump, and I threw the breaker on the pump, and something I did eventually, turns out it was that first breaker, it just just took a while, it, it slowed down, and then it stopped, and I just looked at my wife, and I'm like, I'm not going down there, I'm not, I, I looked in, got it shut on, but I'm not going down there, we're going to bed, I'll look in the morning, you know, I was just, we were just exhausted, I'm like, I'm not dealing with it tonight, so tired, we just went to bed, you know, which probably was not the best thing to do, not inspecting it, you know, but but my emotions were, and for those that don't know, about 12 years ago, we suffered a blown water line in the upstairs, and it flooded the entire house, and we lived in a camper for three months while our house was being restored. And so, you know, but anyway, the damage was done. We just hit pause, went to bed to get some rest, and Margie rested, but I was up until about 2 a.m. I wrestled with the shadows, you know, of my emotions, and I asked myself, I remembered, I asked myself, Mark, why are you feeling the way you're feeling? Yeah. And, uh, and what is it that you're feeling? And I'm sorry to say, it took until about 2 a.m. until I identified the emotion that was upon me. And it turned, it, it, it turned as best as I could. You know, I turned it over to the Lord, and, and then I rested. And in the morning, I crawled down there, and I found it wasn't too bad. Uh, evidently, it blew shortly before we got home. Long story short, you know, uh, um, uh, we got it fixed with the help of Don Fronerman, you know, who found a plumber who came right out and fixed it. Thank you, Jesus. Now, the primary emotion that I identified uh, among many was an emotion somewhere between irritation and indignation uh, because irritation is like when it's a small thing, right? Like, uh, like uh, it's a, a dripping faucet, not a blown line, you know? And, uh, and, or it's a pesky fly that won't go away at the outdoors picnic. And, uh, but this situation was bigger than that, okay, than a pesky fly. Indignation is, you know, and most people have felt it. I know you have. It's, it's when, like, like it's when a, a defenseless elderly person's being jumped, being mugged on a sidewalk, and the justice side of your emotion says, that's just not right. That just shouldn't happen. Like, life should just not be that way for anyone. Life for some people should be more fair. But as we noted in our sermon before, you know, a few weeks back, that indignation is when Jesus had it, but it was, uh, when, it was about vulnerable people being taken advantage of. You know, and Jesus warned us, you know, he, it was never about Jesus. It was always about the vulnerable of the world. And so Jesus warned us that, you know, we're going to have these things. And so I knew that wasn't it. And what I settled on is an emotion that sits somewhere between those two expressions of anger, irritation and indignation. And what I'm simply going to refer to today is the emotion of, frustration 
okay? Frustration. Now, frustration is what I was feeling as a man and as a husband. And in that moment when our house wasn't behaving the way I like it to behave, okay, I mean, it's kind of my job. It's kind of a traditional role, I know, but it's kind of my job to keep things property-wise maintained. So gushers like this uh, don't invade my family's peace and security, right? But the truth is, as a man, as a husband, as a father, frustration is an emotion that will attack you when you feel like your family, like you need to make things right, okay? And deep down, you know this is not an area that you're strong in, so you're frustrated, right? And so fixing it is really out of my control. This, like, plumbing is not my thing. So this, in particular, can be very frustrating. Yeah, and that's not unique to you and me, that kind of frustration. Years ago, Margie and I, uh, and when we first got married, our church had a marriage enrichment seminar, and Mary th- Margie thought it'd be a good idea for us to go, and I agreed, okay, which meant she thought I probably could learn a few things, and I thought she maybe needed a few pointers, right, and so that's kind of how that works. Anyway, the only thing I remember, a long time ago, but the only thing I remember coming away was this story uh, that the speaker told about this young couple who had a communication problem that led to a lot of marital frustration and the problem was focused on um, i'm hesitant to say this in church but it was his underwear okay you see the problem was he had a habit of throwing his dirty underwear on the floor of their bedroom and since she did the laundry evidently they were a traditional couple too she did the laundry. she wanted him to place his dirty underwear in the clothes hamper or the clothes basket okay so she didn't have to pick them up piece by piece But for some reason, probably pride, he just continued to throw his underwear on the floor. I mean, she asked him time and time again. One time she even said, look, it's not difficult. And she threw a pair in there, like, watch this, it's not that hard, which is a rookie mistake. You know, I mean, if you've ever been married a while, like like that will give your man lockjaw, right? He's just going to get lockjaw over the under, like, watch this, it's not that, yeah, that's not going to work. Anyway, it's like he's going to think, you're not my mommy, even though you might be, you know, he's going to say, you're not my mommy, okay? Anyway, long story short, this young wife had finally had enough, and she decided she's not going to wash his underwear if they're not in the clothes hamper, just not going to do it, figuring eventually he's going to need some fresh underwear, and so he'll put them in the clothes basket, but that didn't work. I mean, I don't know. I guess he created a rotation system or something, you know, but he, he didn't do it, okay? And so that didn't work. She began stapling his underwear, stapling his underwear to the floor. Now, I'm not talking about the office stapler. I'm talking about one of those big, heavy-duty, you know what I mean? Boom, boom. She nailed his underwear to the floor. I don't know what she was thinking. Okay, I don't know what she was thinking. But when he ran out of underwear, I guess she assumed when he runs out, he'll, you know, well, they're stapled to the floor. What's she going to? Anyway, I don't know what she's thinking. Anyway, when he ran out of underwear, he just went out and bought some more. So she nailed those to the floor. And he bought some more, and on and on it went until they became so frustrated that they, eat, they ended up in counseling. And that's what I got out of that marriage enrichment seminar. <laughs> anyway, what I learned from all that was, man, hide your staple gun. Okay, hide your staple gun. That's what I know. Okay, now, if there's anyone in the Bible who can understand the tug of war that we experience between irritation and indignation, if there's anyone who, who, who could write a book on, you know, counseling book on frustration, I think it's Moses. Moses because of his people, right? I mean, how many of you know the story of Moses? Show hands this morning. Okay, just about everybody, all right? And a few of you aren't playing. I know you know it too. You're just not playing. Anyway, so yeah, like Moses is one of the really great ones in the Bible. Uh, he's a hero of the faith. I mean, the movie industry's even made a few features about him. He's that famous. So either in Sunday school or in church or at the movie theater, Most of us have had, at one time or another, a front row seat to the story of Moses. Like, when he killed the Egyptian soldier with his bare hands. How many people know that one? Everybody. Okay, yeah, okay. And you remember he took the Ten Commandments because he was frustrated with the people because they are sinning while he's up. He smashes the Ten Commandments, shatters them to pieces. How many remember that one? Everybody, okay, yeah, and most of you, you know the highlights, but there's this one episode in his life that oftentimes gets overlooked, and it's when he nears the end of his life, and it's after his sister has died, and you, and you couple all that with the leadership challenges of he's constantly facing, I mean, historians say he's leading somewhere between two and four million people in the Sinai Desert, which is not exactly a resort area, right, 
It's not like it's plush there. No, no, it's an unhabitable, desolate wasteland. It's awful, and now they've run out of water. And so it's a water situation. Well, actually, it's not. It's a, a no water situation, okay? They have no water. There's no water for the people to drink. There's no water for the livestock to drink. And so we come to Numbers chapter 20. So if you want to turn there this morning in your Bibles or Bible apps, Numbers chapter 20 is where we're going to pick up the story. And while you're turning there, let me just kind of remind you, in addition to those highlights, you know, he's led them out of captivity and they're supposed to be celebrating, but all these people do is just grumble, 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 grumble all the time, okay? It's just one thing after another. So here in Numbers chapter 20 is where the story continues. Beginning with chapter 20, verse 2, it says this. Now there was no water for the community and the people gathered in opposition to Moses and Aaron. They quarreled with Moses and said, if only we had died when our brothers fell dead before the Lord. Why did you bring the Lord's community into this wilderness that we and our livestock should die here? Why did you bring us out of Egypt to this terrible place? It has no grain or figs or grapevines or pomegranates. There's just no water to drink. Frustration, 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 right? And yet, to Moses' credit, he knows that he needs to count down before he blasts off, right? And so, so he needs to respond and not react. And so he doesn't say anything. He just kind of withdraws, distances himself from the angry mob, goes into the tabernacle to play. In other words, he takes this situation and all of his emotions about it to God, which is what we've been saying you need to do, right? So he does. And that's, that's where God meets him. Okay, now God says in verse 8, Moses, take the staff and you and your brother Aaron gather the assembly together Speak to that rock before their eyes, and it will pour out its water. You will bring water out of the rock for the community so they and their livestock can drink. Let's do it again. You and Aaron must take the staff, you know, your wooden staff, and assemble the entire community and so the people can watch you. And you're going to what? Speak to the rock. Note, God says, speak to the rock, okay? Speak to that rock over there, uh, and you're going to want to highlight that, okay? Uh, speak to the rock over there, and it will pour out its water, and you will, you will have enough water from the rock to satisfy the whole community and all the livestock. So God looks at Moses and says, hey, buddy, this isn't your problem. It's my problem, because I'm, I mean, I mean, you didn't lead the people here. I led the people here. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take you to that cliff rock right over there, and I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to open it up, okay? Uh, and living water is going to gush out, and the water shortage will be fixed. So we're taking care of it. I mean, Moses is people too, right? I mean, he's people. I mean, he's a hero of the faith, but he's still like you and me. And, and, and he doesn't really trust that, okay? Doesn't really listen, doesn't really obey completely. And completely is kind of important, okay? <laughs> completely can be important. So Moses goes back to the people, and it says, now listen now for the, the frustration in his voice. He says to the people in verses 10, B, and 11, listen, you rebels. <laughs> listen, you rebels. Must we? Must we? And he includes himself in this, right? Because he doesn't say, must God, but he says, must we. Like, there's God and me, and then there's all you rebels, okay, over there. No, he says, must we bring you water out of this rock? And then Moses raised his arm, and he struck the rock twice with his staff, and water gushed out, and the community and the livestock drank. And it all seems good, right? Except, someone pointed out, though, that, that, that anger is just one letter sh short of the word danger right anger is just one letter short of danger like someone needs to whisper in moses ear here danger danger moses you know like like don't hit the rock moses don't strike the rock but moses struck the rock in frustration and water gushes out and the people are filling up their yeti water bottles and, and god says hey moses right hey moses can can i talk to you over here for a second you know and so moses goes over to the corner and god says verse 12b because you did not trust in me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land that I'm going to give them. Because you did not trust me, right? You did not trust me enough. I mean, you trusted me some, but you did not trust me enough to demonstrate my holiness to the people of Israel. You will not lead them into the land I'm giving. So we see, indeed, anger is just one letter short of danger. Now, if you think that, that a bit severe of God, I mean, Moses will not be allowed to lead God's people into the promised land. He's been leading them all this time, and it's about time to go in, but he won't. I, I mean, and it seems like uh, such a harsh penalty, you know, for what he's done. After all, God had him strike a rock in Exodus 17. They needed water once before, and he struck it that time, and that was okay, but it's not now. 
And we learn a little later in 1 Corinthians in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4, why that is. There we read that this rock was a special rock, that this was a spiritual rock that traveled with them wherever they went. Like there's a rock traveling with them, okay? And it went wherever they went, kind of a spiritual rock that provided living water. And the Bible says there in 1 Corinthians 10, the Bible says that rock was Christ. And he struck it twice. But the point is, as God says to Moses, you did this in a way that did not demonstrate my holiness. And as we learn later, some of Christ's glory is stolen. In other words, you took some of the glory, you took some of the honor for yourself. This was about God. So the question today is very simple. How do we deal with frustration in a God-honoring, faithful way? Okay, Moses was a great biblical hero, and and, uh, he's he's part of the Hall of Faith, but he got frustrated. His frustration got the best of him. So how do we we deal with frustration in a God-honoring, faithful way? Let me give you two simple steps this morning, and the first step is this, and for note-takers, you'll want to write this down. I want to challenge you to focus on the good things and not the bad things. Okay, now that that sounds, those are very simple words, but, but it's a big concept, Okay. Focus on the good things and not the bad things. In other words, focus on the blessings in life, not the obstacles. Now, please listen to me, church family, because right now in our country, our country's having a really hard time doing this, okay? And many Christ followers are no exception. They're having a really hard time doing this because they're being attacked and taken captive by all the bad things that's going on around them. And so doing this, focusing on the good things, well, the nightly news is going to challenge you on this, right? I mean, to wa- if you watch the nightly news, you're going to have a hard time focusing on the good things, okay? And the social media, is that going to help? No, it's going to make it, it's going to be a challenge. If you're spending a lot of time, it's going to be a challenge focusing on good things if you're on social media. The people you rub shoulders with every day are going to make that a challenge, okay? And here's why. Because the average American will complain 15 hours per month to a friend, a family member, or a coworker. So the people around you are telling you about all the bad stuff that's going on in the world, right? So it's hard, okay? It's going to be hard, okay? And so, you know, all those things are kind of opposed to celebrating the good things, the blessings of God. So I want to draw our attention to some small but good things that we can pay attention to this week. And, and there are many more, but I just got some simple ones, a few ones this week. Let me see. I, ha- I brought a box with me. By the way, it says Fish USA. <laughs> you know, good stuff came in this, right? I try to focus on that kind of stuff. Anyway, uh, this one. How many of you have, this is a garage door opener. How many have one? Wow, just about everybody. Yeah, garage door for there, that, that's a good thing, right? Like you don't even have to get out of your car. You just push the button and the thing opens and you don't have to get out in the rain. You don't have to get out in the snow. You don't have to talk to your nosy neighbor, you know, whatever. And uh, you just, you're in, right? It's a good thing. You have a garage, okay? And so you just magically push the little button and mysteriously the door goes up and it's all good. A blessing, yes. Good thing, yeah. Little thing, but a blessing. Okay, uh, I have another one in here. Uh, let me find it. there toothbrush how many have one yeah you better raise your hand right <laughs> how many of you used it this morning yeah and how many of the people sitting beside them are saying praise jesus they used their toothbrush this morning it, it's a good thing right a toothbrush is a good thing you know uh yeah so it blessing yes speak to me church blessing yeah okay I, this is fun i got another one and then uh, spoon <laughs> How many have one? At least one, you know? Yeah, everybody. Okay, now this is, this is a cereal spoon. Uh, this is so you don't have to eat your soggy cornflakes with your fingers, right? And uh, you, you, did you do that? Like my, the little kids, the, the twins that are a year old, they, they eat with their fingers, okay? They haven't learned this yet, okay? They have one, but they haven't learned it yet. So this is good, so you don't have to. But, so this is fun. So this is your cereal spoon, but, but I have more than one. Um, I have an ice cream spoon. You got to have priorities in life, if you know what I mean, right, Gary Hawks? Yeah, I know Gary Hawks is an ice cream man, you know. Yeah, you got an ice cream spoon. Blessing? Yeah, man, it's good. This is fun. Okay, how many of you have one of these? Bottled water. What? Not everybody, huh? How many of you have a refrigerator that with nice, clean water comes out of? Yeah, a lot of you. A lot of you, okay. Yeah, it's a good thing. Uh, water, uh, you know, you... We, we have it, most of us have clean water coming out, but st- we still do this. 
we still do this, right? Buy, buy a case of it every week because, you know, it's hard to come by. And, uh, and, uh, but we're, a blessing, yes, clean water to drink. Blessing, good stuff. Speak to me, church, yes? Okay. Now, I had the privilege years ago. I'm going to move this over here. I had the privilege years ago of uh, uh, traveling to a northern region in the Dominican Republic, uh, which is way up in the mountains. And for those that went to Haiti, way up in the mountains would be very similar to what you experienced in Saul in Haiti, those that went to Haiti. Haiti's like the poorest place, I think, around. And, uh, but, but way up in the mountains of the Dominican, this was back in 98, I think it was, and we went way up there. Our, our family, uh, all of us went along with 31 people. We went on a 10-day mission project, came alongside a couple missionaries, Doug and Carol Reed, that had been serving there for 25, 30 years, uh, ministering in that region. And during that 10 days, we slept on a concrete floor with a little foam pad, right? Uh, concrete floor. Uh, they had a schoolhouse there. It was the only block building in the whole village, and it was a schoolhouse that the missionaries had built for them. Concrete floor, concrete walls, wooden trusses, tin roof, you know, and it had a chicken wire fence around it, you know, to mark off the schoolyard, and that was our compound. And we felt blessed to have it because we thought we were going to sleep on the ground in tents. So we had an actual building. But still, sleeping on concrete's not a lot of fun, and a little thin pad doesn't make much of a difference. So that was, we thought we were roughing it, okay? We showered 30 seconds each day under a 55-gallon drum. You put water in there, it heats up during the day. It's black, it heats up. You get 15 seconds to get wet, soap up, 15 seconds to rinse. That's your shower for the day. Or you could go down and bathe in a river where everything from the village flowed in there, you know? But, uh, and then we ate dehydrated food that you add water to, you know, hard-boiled eggs from the village, we drank instant coffee or flavored water, filtered or bottled water, you know, if we could get it. And the only bathroom facilities that we had was out back at uh, the schoolhouse. There was an outhouse there, a block outhouse with a concrete block toilet. It didn't have a hole. It had a little square in the middle, and uh, which we duct taped a toilet seat to because... You know, you got to have some comfort, you know, so we duct taped a toilet seat to it. But here was the rule when you went out there in the dark. You never, ever turn your flashlight on when going in the bathroom at night because what you see, you'll never go in there again, okay? <laughs> like there were cockroaches and spiders and tarantulas. And so here's the thing. We, you know, we just, we thought we were roughing it. <clears throat> and, and we looked around and we realized even now we're so blessed. Because, well, here, here was our, our day for 10 days. By day, from sunrise to about 5, with a short break for lunch, some of us built a concrete church building with a tin roof, while some of the team, some other members of the team, traveled to one of the other villages uh, in the back of the missionary's pickup truck, which y there weren't many roads, so most of the time you were driving the creek channel, the river channel, which was shallow enough to get through, or otherwise you just didn't go, okay? And they went to a surrounding village where they did a children's VBS program. Some of them did a children's VBS program. We also had some nurses on the team, so the nurses did a medical clinic while the VBS was going on. And then they'd return to camp for the evening meal. And in the evening, we had a worship service every evening in the building that we were constructing. So in the beginning, it was just a little bit of a block wall and part of a concrete floor. And by the end of the 10 days, it was completely built. But in the evening, we had this worship service with walls, concrete walls. We built a baptistry in it. You had to haul water from the river to fill it up, you know, and so, you know, you, and there was no way to keep it fresh, but anyway, we, we worship with these believers of the local church, but because the Americans were in town, the whole community turned out, uh, like it was, everybody was there because they're looking, they're just looking at you, you know, and, and they all turned out because our team was the talk of the village, so basically we worked and ministered all day, and then we worshiped with the community all evening, and I mean all evening, all evening, okay, like they don't have watches, okay, they, uh, they, most of them don't have watches, they just sunrise, sunset, but the worship was awesome, uh, the concrete building with some folks sitting on wooden benches, others standing or looking at in the concrete windows, and there were guitars and tambourines and lots of clapping, and there were all these smiles and joy and singing at the top of their voices, and we didn't understand any of the songs, we didn't know any of the songs, they weren't songs that we've ever sang, didn't know the melodies, we didn't understand a word they were singing, the preacher preached on and on and on, and most of us didn't understand understand a word he was saying and it went on for two hours and then it went three hours and it was awesome 
You know, it was awesome. And the last night we were there, the baptistry was filled, and I don't know how many it was. They were lined up, whole families sometimes, with tears running down their cheeks, and they were lifted out of that baptistry in Christ, and they, the tears running because they were free from their sins and free from their burdens to live a new life. And what we saw while we were there made us repent. I mean, I remember asking God to forgive me for my excess and my lack of thankfulness and my lack of generosity for the people there they they didn't have garage door openers and do you know why they didn't have a garage they didn't have a car you know they didn't have anything i mean they lived in one room shanties this is what their house out was constructed of wooden poles pounded planted in the ground just wooden poles and then they would put cross uh, you know, pulls across, and then they would tack pieces of wood or pieces of tin. I saw a smashed, you remember, is it Mr. Chips potato chips? Was that it, Mr. Chips or Mr. Goods or who, who is it? Anyway, those pretzel cans, you know, with the guy's name on it, I saw one of them smashed flat and tacked to the side of one of those shanties. You know, they just tack stuff on there, tack stuff on the roof. I mean, I mean, just one room shanties with, with you know, wood or tin siding you know dirt floors that the women swept every day and they swept them with home homemade brooms made out of twigs you know in a big ball with rope tied with a stick in the middle of it you know and they swept them morning noon and night those those dirt floors were clean you know and and, uh, and they slept in there they cooked in there you know a large family some of them all living in this one room shanty no luxuries no nothing pretty much maybe one or two radios in the whole village you had to be rich because you needed batteries because they only had electricity occasionally in that village i mean that part of the country they just don't get electricity that comes on like once a week for a few hours at the medical clinics the ones that we provided our team passed out toothbrushes and toothpaste much like what you saw this morning the whole village turned out because they knew it was happening i mean it's not that they didn't know what they were they just don't have them and so they all turned out. Some of them got in line twice trying to get a second round, but we had a local villager there going, mm, you had going your way. You know, they wanted to get more than one, you know? I mean, they, they knew what they were, but they couldn't afford it. They passed out used eyeglasses that we collected before we went. They didn't fit those people's eyes perfectly, but people were so thankful for them. They passed out parasite medicine, cleaned ears, treated all kinds of conditions as best they could. They don't have doctors in urgent care facilities. They have to travel hours and hours to get medical care, and they don't have cars. They ride mules. They have mules. Bottled water, running water, not so much. They go to the river for drinking water, and they go to the river to wash their clothes, and they go to the river for just about everything. And I could go on and on. They were so poor. And yet, to look at them, they were so rich because they were so dependent on their God. Now, they have evils in those villages, and, and we were warned while we were there of what the evils were, but there was good. There was evil, but there was good. And when we left there 10 days later, our eyes were opened, and we realized that we are so blessed and that God has been so good to us, so good that most of the team members, they gave away. You just couldn't go away. Like, if you had new boots and a hammer and, you know, all the stuff we took, like, that's riches to those people. They can sell it, like, you, nobody had the heart to pack anything up and take it home. They just gave it all away. Just wear the clothes that you need for today and tomorrow and give the rest away. And they gave away their boots. They gave away their hammers, whatever it was. They left it all. They just gave it away. Listen, friends, the Bible teaches that God is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he invites us to be the very same way. There are people actually modeling for us, uh, imitating that. The other night, I went to YouTube, and instead of watching tutorials on how to catch fish, which is what I like to do, I sat for a couple hours after Margie went to bed, and I just stayed up for a couple hours watching videos of people all over the world. There's tons of them out there, all over the world, doing compassionate good deeds for other people that they don't even know. Simple things. Like, like in the UK, there was this elderly woman who was stuck on this four-lane street, like two streets here and two here with a meeting in the middle and she'd made it halfway across but couldn't the traffic was too heavy she just couldn't make it across because she's too slow <laughs> like you'd have to run across but she's too slow and so she can't get across until the guys in a truck a work truck, going the other way slowly pull into the meeting they pass her slowly pull into the median and then they slowly pull out and block the two lanes on the other side of the road almost two lanes and they get out of the truck and one guy goes where they might try to sneak around he stands there 
holding traffic at bay while the other guy takes this elderly woman by the arm and they slow walk it across the street to the other side. Then they get back in their truck and they go on their way. A good deed? Yes? Yeah. In another video in Wisconsin, a police officer pulls over a college student who's speeding, and when the student tells him this story, you know, that he's speeding only because he's late for an important presentation in class, and he had to stop at a buddy's place because he doesn't know how to tie a necktie. He's got a, he's got a necktie he wants to wear, but he doesn't know how to tie it, you know? And you can see in the video that his buddy either didn't know either, or he wasn't home because the tie's still not tied. He's holding it in his hand. And the officer takes the tie, puts it around his own neck, ties the tie, then he takes it off and gives it to the student and it's a little high so they take it off and the officer ties a new tie you know, a new knot you know and, and this time it fits and he helps him cinch it up and he sends him on his way so he's not late for his presentation a good deed yes yeah another video taken by a man in a grocery store parking lot in greensville south carolina it shows brandon rollins a young man who worked in the store seeing an elderly woman struggling to carry this little grocery sack of food to her car he comes running out of the store takes the woman's hand holds her by the hand just like it's grandma you know it's just like it's grandma and he slow walks her to the car and helps her get in good deed yes yeah so simple Now, I know we've all seen that kind of good deed, and many of you, I know, you've done them. And I know what you feel because I do too. But what I think we need to understand is that those are the kind of things that truly will tip the scale in our culture. Not the things that come out of a frustrated heart, but the things that come out of a heart of love, okay? These are the kind of things where people just love other people. You just love other people. And I know there's plenty of bad out there, and I'll not argue that, but I just want to encourage you to find the good, focus on the good, and just watch what happens to your blood pressure. It'll come down. All right? Good? All right, number two, focus on the eternal things, not the earthly things. Focus on the eternal things, not the earthly things. I read about a fight that broke out in a grandmother's kitchen between two cousins and it spilled out into the front yard and the police got called by the neighbors. And I want to read just two sentences taken from the nightly news. It says this, Garcia was charged with aggravated battery in connection with an altercation with his cousin who sustained injuries from a pocket knife. Authorities and witnesses all confirmed that the argument was over whether almond milk was superior to whole milk. (laughs) <laughs> and I read that and I'm like are you kidding me you know now personally I'm a two percent man okay but if you're one percent person I'm okay with that please don't stab me right I mean it's all right okay but there's just there's more and more of that in the world right I'm like really almond milk versus whole milk but we see it all the time because the frustration level is just so high it's just so high. It's happening all the time. So here, here's the question I have this morning. Do you ever wonder when you read these stories in the Old Testament, I mean, like, do you suppose Moses, after he loses it with the wooden staff and strikes the rock, like, does he keep a sliver of that staff around, you know, kind of as a reminder, you know, or, or some of the fragments from the Ten Commandments that he broke, does he, keep, does he keep a piece of that, you know, as a visible, tangible reminder to him that some things in life are just not worth getting frustrated and angry over? I mean, maybe it was that kind of sentiment that motivated Paul to put this to pen, his pen to paper and say this. He said, hey, think about the things of heaven and not the things of earth. So this week, in traffic, when somebody rolls through a four-way stop and takes your turn, you know, cuts you off, or you burn the roof of your mouth on pizza or, or hot coffee, or you stub your toe on a piece of furniture, take a deep breath and say, temporary, Right? This is temporary. It's not permanent. It's not eternal. If you need a daily reminder, there's all kinds in creation. Just look at the sun. Did the sun come up this morning, church? Yeah. Is it coming up tomorrow morning, Lord willing? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, unless the Lord returns, there's always another day coming. And with the potential of a next day, there's the potential for a better day. And that's why the psalmist said in Psalm 30, verse 5b, weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. Right? Right? And sometimes the way we think about earthly things and eternal things is this way. I mean, sometimes we just need to be reminded that you have more life ahead of you than you do behind you. All of you, if you're in Christ, right? I mean, that's true for anyone who's a follower of Jesus. I don't care how old you are. You have more life ahead of you than you have behind you. Good thing, right? 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's true for anyone that's a follower. I mean, Moses is north of 100 years of age when he hits the rock with the wooden staff. Maybe he just needed a Snickers bar. I don't know. You know, I mean, you, ever, you, you know that one? I mean, uh, maybe he needed a Snickers. I, sometimes, I mean, like when I get hungry and tired, I get grouchy, don't you? Anyone? Amen? Yeah, come on now. Amen? You know it. Yeah, and, and you know what else? Uh, I tend to overbook and overcommit. Like, I put too much in, right? I, it's my own source of frustration because when I don't fulfill what I put in on my to-do list, it doesn't get done. You know how I feel? I feel like a failure that day. Like, I didn't get it all done. I failed today, you know, as a father or a husband or a preacher, you know, whatever. And I'm, and I'm like you. I mean, Satan gets in my ear and begins to whisper and, and replay the tape, and he tries to convince me that God's bucket of forgiveness is smaller than my bucket of sin. And, and listen, friends, I'm here to tell you today, especially if you're new to the Jesus thing, that's just not true because God's bucket of forgiveness is always way bigger than your bucket of sin, right? And, and, and his bucket of joy is bigger than your bucket of sadness and his bucket of hope, healing, and help is always bigger than your bucket of hurt. So let me, let me tell you something I'm evidently still learning, okay, uh, when it comes to frustration, and that is that there are three possible outcomes with frustration. One, and you can write these down if you want. I don't think we have them on the screen, but you can write them down. You can express it, okay? Like, I mean, you can punch things, throw things, yell at things, kick things, complain about things. But let me ask you, church family, have you ever seen any of that work for anybody? Speak. Has it worked? No, it doesn't. Not really. No. Okay. So that's not a good one. All right. A second one, you can repress it. Okay. Meaning you can stuff it, bury it, sweep it under the rug, go to bed and pretend there's no leak. Right. I mean, I mean, uh, it's not there. Right. And, uh, but everybody you interact with sees your baggage. Okay. They can tell you're hurt. They can tell you're angry. So that's not working. So maybe, maybe you need to do what God, who, by the way, always has your best interest in mind. I mean, you can do what he tells you to do. I mean, that's like an option, right? I like, like you could maybe confess it or you could just share it in a prayer. And it doesn't need to sound religious. I mean, lying in bed, just say, Father, this is your house and this is your leak. Right? It's not mine. It's yours. Father, this is your house. This is your leak. Or it's, it, it's your lawsuit. It's your custody battle. It's your divorce. You know, that infertility season, that's yours. That cancer, just whatever it is that day, just give it over to him. Because he's compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in love. And he wants to lift that off of you. The other night, laying in bed, let me share my thoughts as they kind of rolled through my mind for five hours as frustration came out of the shadows and attacked me. This is, this is going to be bad. I went to bed thinking, this is bad. <laughs> okay, This is so bad. We're going to have to turn another insurance claim in. We're going to have to live in a camper for three months while they put heaters under this house and dry everything out. You know, this is going to drain our emergency fund. This is going to be a nightmare. I don't know anything about plumbing. I'm ignorant about plumbing. I can't fix this. I can't control this. This is going to weigh on my family. What a mess this is. I'm so frustrated. This is the last thing I need to deal with right now. We're in the building of a building project. God, did you not notice? You know, I mean, I mean, we've got stuff to do. I've got a lot on my plate this week. I don't have time on my schedule for this. That went on for about five hours until 2 in, a in the morning, and then finally I turned to God, and the Spirit reminded me of something I shared with you time and time again when he said, you know, it's just temporary, right? And then I thought, yeah, I know. In 10,000 years, this is a non-issue. This isn't eternal. It's just temporary. And this house, it's not my house. It's your house, Lord. And that emergency fund, it's not my emergency fund. It's your emergency fund. So really, this isn't my problem at all, Lord. It's yours, right? Isn't that true? And while I hadn't bought completely into that, <laughs> you know, I bought into it just enough to say to the Lord, okay, this is yours, Lord. And in the morning, you can let me know how you're going to deal with this in the morning, right? And he did. And you know what he told me in the morning? He said, call Don Froderman. <laughs> That's what he said. I'm not kidding. I call Don Froderman. He'll give you the name of a guy that he knows, right? Because Don always knows a guy, right? And you all can laugh about that, but after crawling around in that dark space under the house the next morning, I cleaned up with uh, some water. You know, it, it's nasty down there. I just told Jonathan two weeks ago, I'm never going down there again. I hate going down there in that cross space. I went down there. I went the whole way across it. I looked at everything. It wasn't that bad. But, uh, 
anyway, and I got out, and I'm like, now how do I get clean, right? Well, we had some water and some bottles, so, you know, just for, you know, if the power shuts off, so I used that to clean up. I went to the church office, and I put my stuff down, and I'm sure the staff noticed I had hurt, you know, I, I wasn't healed by any means, and, uh, but I, I went in my office, and I began to pull out my phone to call Don Frederick, because that's what God said to do, and just as I pulled it out, it rang. Uh, Jenny Clark can to attest to this because she saw it and I said, ah, it's Don Froderman. <laughs> it was, wasn't it, Don? It's Don Froderman. And you know what? He knew a guy. In fact, he called the guy for me, and a couple of hours later, it's all good. But God wasn't done yet. Because Tuesday morning, that was Monday morning. Tuesday morning, I no sooner get to the church and the phone rang, and it was my wife, Margie, and in an urgent voice, she said, there's something wrong in the laundry room. The water's coming out on the floor. The water's coming out of the water sub. Maybe it's the water. I don't know what water's coming out of, but water's coming out on the floor. And I said, well, pull the plug on the water softener. I'll be right home. It's temporary. Now, I didn't say that to her, okay, because that'd be a rookie mistake, okay? I didn't say that to her, but I said it to myself on the way home, and I got home, and by the time I got there, the water had stopped because it was the water softener, and it was just temporary, and it wasn't that big a deal, and, and but... But let me share this in closing as I kind of have worked through this all week long. God keeps taking my mind back to that time in the Dominican years ago to the worship service when, where it just went on for hours and hours. And those people who are so poor and so in need and so hurting, I wonder if maybe they worship so long and so hard with all their hearts because if you look close, you can kind of see desperation in their tone and desperation in their inflection. You know, like they need heaven to be real, you know? I'm not sure we all the time need heaven to be healed because we're pretty good at fixing things. But they need heaven to be real because earth is, for them is not good. And they needed God's throne to be real and immovable, and it is. I mean, our God is immovable, unchangeable. Isn't he, church? Yes, he is. He is, even when life circumstances for us only aren't, aren't always like that. I mean, you know, those people, their needs are not bigger 401Ks. Their needs are not bigger garages or garage door openers. They don't need better water softeners. They don't have any. I mean, none of them have 401Ks. None of them have health care or paved streets or indoor plumbing. But you know what they have? I mean, there was joy there. And not necessarily happiness all the time, but joy. And then at the end of each service, there was prayer. And I could tell that God wasn't just Yahweh to them, but he was their father. He was their dad. And they were dependent on him to give them life. And on that last night, I could see it in all the baptisms. They were so elated to have that burden lifted off their shoulders. And I thought, they don't care all that much about what I see that they don't have. Right? They don't care about that at all. I mean, they, they don't care at all about parasites in the water. They don't care that they have to walk miles to get anywhere, some of them. I mean, they don't care about the wooden benches that they have to sit on and the creepy crawlies that are in their homes or in their bathrooms. They just don't care. So I just want to remind you today, because we're family, focus on the good, not the bad. And focus on the eternal, not the earthly. And before your feet hit the ground every morning and before your head rises up from the pillow, just stop and say to yourself out loud, I have way more life ahead of me than I have behind me. Do that, and you'll be surprised how you'll just slow down, and uh, it'll cause you to count your blessings, and it'll bring you peace. And all God's people said, let's pray that it might be so. Father, we give thanks for the day. And uh, Lord, uh, Lord, we lift up our lives before you. And uh, life gives us frustrations every day. Every day it gives us frustrations. And Lord, uh, uh, there's a number of ways that we can respond, but we know the best way is when we just walk life hand in hand with you and understand that it's your life and it's your deal and that you'll handle it and we just go along for the ride. And so, Lord, we lift our lives before you and, and as we, we uh, leave this place today, Lord, we pray that we walk with you and you'd walk with us and we'd do life together and we would understand that heaven is real. We'd have eyes to see that heaven is real. And the things that lie before us, they're temporary. They're just temporary. They won't matter in 10,000 years. And Lord, that we would understand just how blessed we are and how life, there's a lot of good in life. And you would help us to see it. You'd help us to cr help us create some of it. Help us to see opportunities to do good, to be part of the kingdom of good rather than the kingdom of evil and spew out whatever with frustration. 
So, Lord, we lift our lives before you. We pray that we would walk with you and you walk with us and we would be your people. We pray it to the glory of Jesus Christ and his kingdom. Amen.